Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by not Billy Hall. He's not here. He's out of town for the holidays, but I do have Blake Arnsdorf here. Hello, everybody. How are you? And making his Human Factors Cast debut is Woodrow Gustafson. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. So we are back. Uh, the Star Wars podcast was a success. I'm very happy. Um, but we will be doing our Human Factors cast as normal now. Um, I know some of you were upset about last week's episode because it wasn't Human Factors cast, but we're back. Uh, we just wanted to kind of throw it out there as an alternative format and, and just see kind of how it went. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, we are talking about some fun stuff today. Uh, first, let me explain why Woodrow's on the show. So Woodrow took a good hard listen to our ergonomics episode, and he had a lot of problems. Not, not, not problems, just um, I, I was intrigued by some of your answers. <laughs> he, <he's, laughs> Which is Woodrow, good. <laughs> Woodrow is here to school us. So, so Woodrow, you, you've been trained in uh, human factors engineering, right? Classically. That's correct. Okay. Um, and uh, what other stuff? So we're talking ergonomics. So you're, you're obviously qualified here to talk about this. So what kind of other, other stuff do you have going on um, that makes you qualified to talk about ergonomics? Uh, yeah, so I do have a, uh, <clears throat> I did my uh, graduate work and uh, in, during my graduate work, I was actually a fellow for uh, NIOSH for two years. So under there, you get a lot of training, you get a lot of uh, certifications, uh, and you do, you do a lot of work in physiology uh, and work uh, uh, ergonomics and, and stuff like that. So. Okay. That's cool. And, and so can you just uh, – for I'm going to try to take the role of Billy here today yeah. since he's not here to slow us down. But what is NIOSH just for our listeners? Uh, since you couldn't explain it uh, last time. Uh, <laughs> Schooling was, me. That was, that was my biggest thing. We're already taking the hits. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, it's, it's National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And what do they do? So uh, so you can think of NIOSH as uh, maybe kind of like the, the little sister of OSHA. So OSHA's Occupational Safety um, and Health uh, Association. Right. They're the ones that actually make all the laws and the governing rules and regulations. NIOSH actually is uh, the um, research side of things. Okay, so so NIOSH is the research and OSHA is like the application? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So so you've been trained in all these things. Yes. Um, now, now, this is cool because we, both Blake and I, are not ergonomics people. We are... Scientists, we're scientists. Straight but, up, but I mean, like, scientist, yeah. I have zero ergon. I have very little ergonomics experience. Yeah, I don't know if I had even any in grad school. To be honest with you, I oh, think really? it was. I, yeah, I don't really think so. It was oh, just wow. like methodology and psychology. That was yeah. really it. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I did a different path. I did my undergrad in psychology, but then switched to engineering, uh, and that's where I got the majority of my ergonomic training, which was was in grad school and engineering program. So, so, so what? It, so, in grad school, you you actually did your thesis on. Ergonomics. Yeah, yeah. So I did it on uh, active workstations. Um, so we're talking uh, sit, stand, and treadmill desks. How, yeah. they, how they affected people's performance uh, and workload on on kind of uh, daily tasks. Now that's that's really cool to me. So we actually had a conversation offline about this, but let's kind of recapture that conversation. So I asked you, what's the bottom line? What's going to help me in the long term? Like what what which configuration should I have? Should I have sit stand or should I have stand or should I have treadmill or what? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it kind of depends. Um, and and that surprise. really quick is the, <laughs> the motto of our show. We end every show with "It depends," uh, because it's true in a lot of cases. It it is it does depend a lot on um, some of the things. So it, it does. And uh, the thing the thing you have to think about it though is uh, you, it, no matter what you have, sit stand um, or a treadmill desk or both, uh, you have to use it in moderation. And that's uh, one of the key things for for using these is is you know you have to do just little short stints and then you got to give your your muscles a chance to kind of recover so you know alternating between sitting and standing and and sitting and walking do we have uh sort of an optimal time for that like yeah yeah typically it's uh, about 45 minutes to an hour um and then you alternate and then you should alternate okay um and that that just gives your chance because uh by about that time that's when your muscles either start fatiguing or really start 
um, start acting up, and so uh, without you even realizing it. So right, yeah, so you need to hold true for all of the different types because you have like active workstation, and I'm assuming was it different b- between like treadmill desk and then sit and stand as far as like how long you were able to just like keep it up without fatigue. Uh, no, actually, because the uh, the walking the walking actually was uh, at a very slow pace. I think we had them set at one and a half mile an hour. Okay, cool. um, so it's a real real casual pace. Um, one of the big things though is actually is tax dependent. So, um, you know, while you're actually walking, you don't want to be doing, uh, you know, fine motor control tasks or typing that's, that's affected the most, but actually cognitive tasks, um, were actually, uh, increased significantly on performance wise. Uh, and that re- relates back to a lot of research on, um, you know, uh, cognition and, and, uh, uh, working out and stuff. So that's cool. So <clears throat> we have you on the show today, uh, to basically talk about some of these ergonomic misconceptions, right? Because, there's there's a lot of things that are falsely advertised as ergonomic out there in the field, uh, and we're we're kind of revisiting this just because. Well, it's well, definitely good to get a professional's point yeah, of view yeah. on this for sure. Well, one, yeah, we are not professionals in ergonomics, but Woodrow here I, I, will. Well, I, I just want to point out, <laughs> I, I do not consider myself a professional. You are um, more well versed than we are, and that you, is yes. good enough for us. Okay. <laughs> I'll take no, professional I mean, like, in my mind. <laughs> but I mean, like you have you have certifications, and you have you know you're you're good. If you have certifications, I I consider that good. Yeah, and that's you know, and that's that's part of that training, the NIOSH training. They they really do prepare you, whether you go into it or not. You know, so it's um, it's always a, a good thing to have um, well versed. But but yeah, so some of these uh, misconceptions. I mean, there's there's a lot out there, and you see a lot of product products labeled as ergonomically designed. Um, you know, and and so that's that's a big selling point for people. Right. So let's just back up really quick and, and kind of get down into the nitty gritty of what ergonomics is. Uh, just to remind everyone, I guess, uh, and, and let me know if you disagree with this definition or, or whatever. Um, we can we can talk about it for sure. But ergonomics basically aims to create something that's safe, comfortable and efficient by bringing basically that human operator or the human um, and, and what they're able to do into the design of something, whether that be a workspace or a product or a handheld device or, or whatever it is, right? Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And then, uh, so yeah, ergonomics is focusing on that physical aspect of the human, right? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about neuroergonomics later, but for now, uh, so we're reviewing ergonomics again because Woodrow's here because we're interested in the topic because of all these misconceptions. So let me ask you a question, Woodrow. Are there any specific requirements basically to be labeled ergonomic? Uh, not that I, that, not that I'm aware of. I, I actually was doing some research on this um, and I, I didn't find anything that actually states uh, that they, they, a company has to do anything specific to actually label a product as ergonomically designed. Um, so companies can come in and they can just say, this fits the hand well. I'm going to slap an ergonomic label on it, and hopefully it'll sell more units. Yeah. I mean, I think that's pretty much how it is. I think I think what they qualify as, as uh, doing research to make it ergonomically friendly is they might, you know, uh, measure people's hands for, you know, the, the people that work there, which is, uh, you know, a, a end of five or ten. Super uh, small sample to yeah, be, like, ex- making ergonomic claims based off of. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. And so... Well, we talked a lot about uh, the last last ergonomic episode, and maybe you can validate this for us. We talked a little bit about where these sample sizes come from. We we said the military because it's widely available, and when you're designing for that population, it's not the population of the actual population. It's not the sample of the population. It's it's very skewed. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me ask you another question here. So. You talked a lot about your about your education. Is there any sort of ergonomic specific programs in like the graduate track or or anything like that that you're aware of? Uh, you know, not not that I'm aware of for specifically for ergonomics. A lot of these programs do, go through human factors, um, and they they might specialize in ergonomics. Um, I will give my uh, alma mater a shout out because they do have, um, and that's where I came from and, and learned a lot was uh, University of Buffalo for SUNY. Um, but also other organizations and other universities such as Auburn, I know has a great, 
uh, program as well. Again, it is human factors, but they do specialize in, in ergonomics. Which is so interesting to me because I did my psychology degree at Auburn at a time when there was no human factors department even there anymore. Uh, and I didn't even learn about it until I was finishing up my degree. But I, yeah, okay. I saw earlier that you had won like an award for ergonomic design. Was it? Yeah, it was. Uh, so Auburn hosts this um, this ergonomic. Uh, um, what is it? It's a. Uh, oh, it's a. Uh, uh, engineering ergonomic design competition uh, for student teams, and so it's it's these student teams from around the country and, and even the world. Actually, they now have they've expanded it now, um, and it's basically uh, like two three months long, of uh, you know five to six graduate students in a team. And they give you one big problem, and you just have to basically uh, solve it. That's epic, uh, man. And, um, you know, throughout the process, they, they kind of throw you curveballs. They'll give you a 24-hour um, little design challenge. You know, we had to make a video, which I'm trying to find for you guys so you can throw it up on your on your thing. It's pretty funny. Um, yeah, well, once you find it, uh, for sure, we'll, we'll toss it up on the Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so back to this ergonomic-specific track. I mean, we talked a little bit about um, – so – you said there's not really any one program for ergonomics, but human factors and ergonomics kind of go hand in hand, right? Like HFES. Correct. That's short for Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. It's all together. So what's the connection between these two and how are they sort of the same and how are they different? Uh, you know, I think human factors, um, I mean, ergonomics is part of human factors. I mean, it's just, a, it's basically just like a sub-discipline of it. Um, so... Yeah, you, you need you need ergonomics uh, to be um, to have a lot of that engineering discipline along with the psychological aspects as well. And again, you know, you, you said you're going to be talking about neuroergonomics later, and yeah. that's kind of the blend of where it, where it goes from the physical to the mental side of things. All really interesting stuff. So let's let's kind of dig in. Unless you have anything else to add, like yeah, I just like have a general question, and this one's not in the notes. It's just kind of off the cuff. This right? is this is this whole podcast is going to be us going. <laughs> Tell us more, Sensei. We need to know more about ergonomics. Well, it's just interesting because like you've had a little bit of experience, I guess, in your current job, like designing products, right? So, and a lot of the stuff we deal with nowadays is very digitally based. Do you do you think that like your back some of your background in ergonomics has influenced or helped you? Excuse me. Um, it, like better apply design or understand how people are interact with things. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, you know, just because you're you have uh, you know some some background in a specific you know physical side of ergonomics, there are there are aspects of that that you you can take forward to a, a more mental side of things. And like I said, my you know my thesis actually did deal with a lot of uh, uh, cognition and and workload stuff. Um, but yeah, you can, you can apply a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, these disciplines and, and these, uh, concepts, uh, to everyday life and, and, you know, the designs of, of websites, and everything like that. So, all right, so let's go ahead and jump into some of these misconceptions and you can just walk us through whatever you think is important here. Feel free to use the show notes and, and just kind of walk us through some of these ergonomic misconceptions. Okay. So, so, okay, we'll go with the first one here. It's okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the first one here. Sitting up straight is the best posture. Is that true? Uh, not always, no. Um, actually, at a slight de- uh, decline, um, laying, uh, sitting back is actually a pretty good posture. So if you notice, uh, you know, in, in um, like ergonomic chair designs, they always have one posture that's uh, kind of locked slightly back. Um, that's actually, and uh, that's the one, and that's that's the one. That's the one I have mine on set all the time. You I never have been let it sitting go. wrong my entire career. <laughs> I know I've been sitting wrong this whole podcast. I'm like leaning forward and hunching over this microphone, and yeah, it's uh, it just it, it relieves some of the pressure because the problem is is uh, when you are sitting up straight, um, you know, you're actually uh, causing your um, your joints to actually kind of be in an awkward position, being at a ninety degree angle with your hips. So if you lean back a little bit, it's opening that up. So it's uh, it helps huh. a little bit more of the blood flow down to your legs. That's interesting. Really, because that's a big thing that comes <laughs> up. Of like when you're sitting, you're basically cutting off a lot of the circulation and musculature of your legs, which yeah. leads to like some of these tr- problematic disorders and stuff. Absolutely, like that. yeah. And and, the, and one of the big things too is that uh, you know when when you have your feet dangling, uh, if you don't have like we are now, because yeah. we have these really tall chairs. Um, and and another big thing too is also to have uh, your your thighs at a ninety degree angle to the to the floor. Um, uh, anything anything less or more, uh, it, again, it creates that 
that weird uh, angle in, in your knees that can cut off the blood flow to your to your lower legs too. So. so it's all about blood flow, and I mean it makes sense. But is there any any sort of um, any sort of brain benefit or or like cognitive benefit to having all this blood flow going? Uh, yeah, I mean uh, when you have blood flow going, uh, that actually gets back up to your brain, and so you, you're actually it helps with uh, cognition and everything else like that. So. Yeah, if you keep the blood going, um, you can definitely uh, uh, think better and, and work better. So um, that's why also I, I remember on your pod, on the previous podcast, you were saying, Blake, that, uh, you know, you think better when you stand up. Um, and that's and that's actually and it's true because uh, your your heart's working a little harder. Uh, even when you're standing up, you don't realize it. But so you get more blood to the brain. And exactly. So your heart, rate, your heart rate will go up about 10 to 15 percent um, on average um, by standing alone. Well, in the spirit, I'm going to stand up while we do. There you go. You know what? There you go. We're adjusting here. And, uh, yeah, now we're going to do the podcast standing up. This is weird. <laughs> so i got to think on my feet now. There oh, there go. you go. That's like a whole reason why they say think on your feet, right? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. So, okay, let's let's tackle this next one here. New chairs solve all ergonomic problems. Is that true? That is completely false. But I can say, though, that the, uh, the expensive chairs are really, really nice if you know how to use them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so ergonomic chairs, that's, I think, one of the biggest uh, things out there that I've seen that, uh, that, they, that they try to uh, promote. Um, so I, sp- I spend $1,200 on this new chair. It's not good for me. It, it is good for me, is what you're saying. So, but what if it's not? How do you know? How do you know that this new chair is going to be good, ergonomically speaking? Uh, like because what? there's a lot. If it's a $1,200 chair, then there's millions of dollars invested in in the research how do you know that. what if i just sell this chair that we just stood up from for one thousand two hundred dollars and say it's exotic wood i would love to meet the person that bought that <laughs> <laughs> i have a lot of other things to sell them there you go, <laughs> so, yeah. we have a friend in the uh in the mobile gaming industry and the people who spend a lot of money on in-app purchases yeah. are considered the term whales oh like, yeah because yeah. white whale yep moby dick and so I would imagine the person who's making a one thousand two hundred dollar wooden chair is looking for those whales. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there are reputable companies, and I'm not, I'm not going to name drop it. You can, you can definitely look them, look them up. Um, there are some definitely really good companies that have the chairs, and I've, I've personally sat in a few of those twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollar yeah. chairs. And I, if I had the money on me right now, I probably would go buy one. They, they well, you're going to start raking in all this podcast. I, man, man, I there you go, man. <laughs> Um, but no, they, they do. And, and the thing is, is when you always look at ergonomic chairs, you see like, you know, they've got six different settings and all you think is what the hell I need, I need one or two, right? Um, I can lean back, I can move up and down. That's all. But really it's, you know, seat, uh, the, the seat pan needs to be adjusted. The lumbar support needs to be adjusted. I've sat in ones that like have uh, varying degrees of where the armrest can sit like uh, absolutely distance from your body. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause females have a typically smaller frame and so they can right. they can rest them in yeah uh, and you don't and you don't want your elbows out out too much because then that's that's uh flexing your and uh causing uh your shoulders to get strained as well so right so you, so you mentioned lumbar support and you mentioned um sort of posture but what what other kind of factors are you looking for in a chair like uh, when you if you were to buy one right now what kind of chair would you buy what what kind of features would you be looking for? Uh, for me, uh, since I do sit in chairs quite a bit, especially for my job, uh, I definitely look for mesh, um, not leather. It's just uh, helps breathe a little bit more, um, and that's what I have at, at my current job right now. Like, um, is that more important for comfort, or is there actual other benefits to that? Um, I think it's more just for comfort. I mean, it gotcha. does. I feel like it does give you a little bit more support than like a uh, leather, and it won't wear out as fast. Oh, that makes um, sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, like stronger material and all that. Exactly. Kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a little more resistant. Um, uh, but also, you know, the, the lumbar support is, is really uh, um, important. But another big thing is actually the, the shoulders and neck area. Um, the really nice chairs um, that have the shoulder and neck support um, do a world of difference. I mean, it really does help a lot. Really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know about the, like, pointing your elbows out type of thing, infecting your shoulders. Or yeah. affecting, sorry. Because, yeah. like, I definitely infecting. can tell. Yeah, infecting <laughs> your shoulders. <laughs> no, because I definitely tell, like, the strain difference between when I'm paying attention to it and when I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. So while you guys were chatting, I went and grabbed this. Oh yeah, thing. I, have, I have one of those. You got one of these? Oh, on oh yeah, I get those all the time. Okay, so I want to go through this with you on a show, not this show. Yeah. But I want I want to go through and just kind of laugh at some of these let, things. Let me see that uh, picture on the front cover. I think ah. that's I think that might be the desk that I used. That's the same desk I used. I'm pretty sure for my. Uh, 
Yeah, this guy here? Yeah. Just for all the listeners, it's a uh, magazine. It's called Workplace Safety and Ergonomics, and it's got, like, different ergonomic, you know, products. Yeah, and, I mean, some of these in here look like they are actually ergonomic, but then there are some that are just ridiculous. Like, how can you... Well, again, it's just varying varying (laughs) levels of degree, you know. Right. I mean, but... we should pick a few of our favorites out and do a whole episode on them because I feel like that would be a wonderful episode. Monitor stands are always great to do them on. Um, what? Oh, you know what? I want to ask you while you're on the show, what about those keyboards? So the keyboards that are kind of like broken up into kind of like a wave pattern. Yeah, you know? that's, that's what I have. Is that is that ergonomically like... It, it helps. Okay. It's, it's, not, it's still not the best. The ones that are, are the best is, are actually the ones that are actually split in the middle. If you've ever seen those that actually... Uh, are you uh, serious? Yeah. The oh, ones where you're typing man. kind of on the side well, towards the side. Well, not the side, center. but it's... I mean, your, your, your hands, like a, your hands okay, might yeah. be at like a 45 degree angle, 30 degree angle. Oh, I'm sitting here um, thinking like the vertical one where you're doing uh, yeah. those numbers. I've, I've seen those ones. Those ones are even better, but I don't know how people do it. Um, oh, yeah. It'd be really tough. But no, so so... Those are good. the 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 problem is, is uh, everybody knows about carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, it's, right. It's one of the leading causes in musculoskeletal disorders so, in the world. So, what goes on in carpal tunnel? I know, but for our listeners, so so what it is is the the carpal tunnel is actually a, a pathway um, into your wrist uh, that that is uh, holds one of the veins. And the problem with typing and and a lot of uh, fine motor control with your hands uh, is that repetitive movement up and down of your wrist. Uh, actually closes that hole and it actually pinches that nerve and then that's what that's what causes all that pain in your hand <laughs> I'm like so over here just <laughs> so anyone so anyone with a keyboard do me one favor please and please put those feet down on your keyboards break them feet off oh, take them off those are the absolute worst things ever invented um, oh for real so you, you shouldn't have them like never. posted no, up ever. oh wow because think about think about your wrists and how they are when you have them up you're cranking your wrist up, and that's just completely uh, cutting off that vein right you're there. You're 100% right, yeah, looking um, at it from that angle, that's not good. Yeah, so that is the number one thing. If you're going to do anything and listen to me at all uh, at all on this podcast, please take those feet off. We have a whole section of where you give, like, tips, right? And later, oh, you put yeah, those I'm, in? Just, I'm just getting too That's excited, okay. You're man. so excited. excited. You just, just want to tell everybody. All right, let's get into the next myth here. Right. Um, adjustability is synonymous with the word ergonomic. Uh, that is not true. Not true. Um, no, it's adjustability is is a, a main key, and that's and that's what uh, a lot of ergonomic design is about is adjustability because you have to design for uh, different uh, variations of 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 sizes. Right. Adjustable it, to me means we're going to make it possible for a wide variety of people to use this. Right. Now, the way you utilize that is the ergonomics exactly and that's the thing is that they they do design to the 90 sorry guys 90, i can't stand anymore it's <laughs> <laughs> no, no, already out i'm out the uh the 90 to 95 but, percent, it. but no it's um but the problem is is most people don't actually know how to uh, uh properly adjust and so that's where that's where the real uh the real key is and that's and that's where a lot of ergonomic professionals make their money is they go in and do ergonomic assessments on people's workstations and say you're doing uh, it wrong. Yeah, and do it this way. Do it this way. And uh, thanks. I'll I'll charge you hundred bucks an hour. I could see that being lucrative for people because I mean you just get the idea that okay, I got a standing desk. I'm all good. But I I, I quickly realized that without like stands and stuff on my monitors, like I'm kind of doing a half half of a job at it. Yeah, yeah. We should get all of us together and start a firm that does this. Um, I have a company that does this. Yeah, <laughs> it's called HFE Designs. Yeah, All right, I've I done know. I've done consulting work before. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's cool. really cool. Yeah. So so, so, so anyone so can hire Woodrow. HFE Designs dot com and request Woodrow. Yeah, that's right. I'm a lead engineer. There you go. All right, let's get into this next one. Um, so, products labeled as ergonomic are always ergonomic. We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, I think they are, but it's a loose it's loose definition. Um, definitely um, consider your sources. Uh, yeah, I wonder how many of these companies actually put the research out that say, like, we, you know, actually took a look at the product. Our sample size is bigger than five. Yeah, any of that kind of information comes out. But then again, a lot of people are only going to look for the name. They're not going to look for yeah. the behind it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so always, if, if you're going to spend the money, uh, look at look at the brand names. The the bigger brand names have the money to put behind these these ergonomic assessments, and, you know, they're the ones that you should trust. Yeah, that's and, and, cool. and it is your body. Just think about it. You only have one, so spend the extra money. Right, and that goes not just for chairs, but for for any products, right? Like any products you use, keyboards, keyboards oh yeah, mice, mm-hmm. uh, computers, yeah, absolutely, yeah. standing oh, desks, monitors, anything, yeah, for, for sure. sure. All right, so 
Let's get into a couple more of these. We have a lot of these misconceptions. These are awesome. Um, I, I love this. This is fun. Uh, and I, I wish Billy was here, but he's he would he would oh, he knock all these. Yeah, he would knock sure. all these. Um, what's funny behind the scenes is we had Billy on the show earlier, and we went to go start the show, and right as we started the show, uh, we lost him. We lost him. So we're we're trying to get him back. If he if he comes back, he's going to be right in the middle of it. That's okay. All right, let's talk about repetitive motion. So is repetitive motion the number one cause of ergonomic injury? True uh, or false? That is true. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay, because I have it as a misconception. Oh, you do? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I'm pretty sure it actually is is true. Um, if it's not, it's definitely in the top five. Um, and repetitive motion uh, is is one of the things that is the top, uh, one of the, the biggest things they look for when they do ergonomic assessments, especially for... Um, you know, anybody that does any sort of lifting. So I remember last time you, you guys talked about the uh, the NIOSH lifting guide and everything like that. Repetitions is key um, because you have to remember they have to sustain these repetitions over an eight-hour period. So I think yeah. I think one of the points this article makes, and we got this uh, from, let's see, Ergonomic Edge. Ergonomic Edge mm. says that uh, it's not about the repetitive motion. It's about the usage. So even if they are making repetitive motions – and they are using it incorrectly. That's that's what contributes to a um, to the injury, and not necessarily the repetitive motion itself. So, so uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if I could quite agree with that. That's there. That, that's stretching it a little bit because if they if they are using the correct motions, but they're repetitively doing this action, say um, the the best thing to think about is uh, like factory line workers. The people that assemble boxes or uh, one of the best things, one of the classic examples is uh, watching the, the people at a certain um, uh, bourbon manufacturing company hand dip their bottles. Um, that's one of the, the biggest. I wonder what that. Yeah. Who is that? Manufacturing yeah. company could be. But but they, they hand dip them. They hand dip them. Okay. Every, every single bottle is hand dipped, and you cannot imagine these people. And these bottles are you know you're they're they're good they're good weight maybe yeah. you know, a few pounds. But you're talking these people hand dip probably uh, one every you know five seconds. That's and crazy. Five maybe maybe six seconds. I mean they're grabbing them off the line, dipping them, putting them back. Grabbing them off the line, dipping them, putting them back. And you're doing that for eight hours. And you're doing that for eight hours. Now again, you know you're probably taking breaks every couple hours. But think about think about the stress on that. Now they're doing it properly. They've had assessments done, and they, right. they have the mats. They have the the proper um, way you're supposed to lift and everything. But that repetition. And the and the weight those those two things combined uh, make it one of the riskiest one of the riskier jobs. Interesting. We'll take it from the master here. Yeah, for sure. All right. So we got office ergonomics is a hard sell in these tough economic times. Is it hard to sell this concept oh, to people? No way, man. Really? It's, it's, it's got to be. It's got to be the easiest sell. I mean, I, it. So I, I can see that being a hard sell to. I'm a boss. Yeah. You're, you got to convince me to spend my money on this. Right. So how are uh, you going to do it? So the best thing is, um, I mean, what do what do companies pay the most for? Probably healthcare, right? Now, if you can if you can uh, show they they do have uh, incentives um, with if if you have certain ergonomic uh, uh, things in place um, or programs, uh, they actually do have some health um, uh, uh, incentives for companies now. Okay. Um, and I'm not I'm not too too versed on. It. I did look into it a lot uh, when I was in grad school, but. Uh, and so you actually can save your employers thousands and thousands of dollars if you implement certain, um, you know, certain practices. If you if you bring in ergonomic specialists, they can sometimes even uh, apparently write that off, right? Um, because you're trying to help your employees. That's and interesting. Like that. So That's like more companies don't do that then yeah. or take advantage of that in whatever state. They live. Because it, because it's still it's an upfront cost and they don't always return. And yes, the, that's true. The, the return on investment is is their employees' um, health. And state of mind, which um, unfortunately some companies don't see that as uh, as you know uh, money saving. I them. mean, it's an uphill battle with human factors just in general to do that upfront cost of the analysis of oh yeah the testing just to get it you know in the first place to to see what your users need. Um, and so that's I think why they're arguing that this is a hard sell in that um, it's really hard to just convince them that the long-term goal will be worth it i don't know i want to ask you though because you just started at a new company yeah it's a startup i want to get it from that perspective um is do they do anything like this where they have well i mean it's it's a different ball game though really when you're thinking about it that way because we're 
Like we're at a stage where we're a growth company, right? So everything that's coming in is all investment dollars. Like we don't even, because of the size of our company, we don't have health insurance, any of that kind of stuff. So right. it's, it's too low level to do that. Um, but I could see based on the way the culture is going and the fact that's that a, it's, it's mo- going to be a thing. It's mainly human factors. People working in there now, or that's all we're bringing in. So it'll eventually, you know, move towards more of like taking those considerations in. Uh, and people do spend their own money on some of the stuff. Like I bought, you know, a uh, standing desk and then just laptop monitor um, stands and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. Well, I know I worked at a company for a while that um, specialized in making electrical relays. And it was, a, it was a pretty big company. And they actually had a whole uh, ergonomics department. Like I don't know what the official thing was but they had in-house ergonomic assessment people. really yeah um actually uh someone who i went to graduate school with was an intern there as well and they went around and did the office assessments and yeah. adjusted the the uh chairs and the monitors and the working stations and so they took it very seriously and i mean they're a pretty big company so it's interesting to kind of see these different perspectives on like yes they understand that health and safety of their employees is a good thing in right. the long run. Yeah, and if you if you look at some of the statistics I pulled up, I think I, I might have put it on the uh, the show notes there, but um, some of those statistics, uh, I think it's uh, in the billions of dollars that... Um, oh, you know, $20 mus- billion dollars a year? Is is what wow. musculoskeletal disorders um, uh, oh, cost. Wow. That is crazy. Um, Whew. And so if you think about it, just a little bit of investment in front, up front for your employees um, you know, can, can potentially save your company. Um, depend, yeah, can, depending on depending on uh, you know what your resources are, and obviously you can't overextend yourself to the point of of your uh, you know especially like a growth company like that, you can't. Yeah, um, right. But I mean, know. for it's going to be a hard sell unless it's a company that's either established or um, knows their employees are going to stay. Like because in growth Absolutely. and startup companies, you just you never know what's going to happen. Yep. Is it going to go under? Is it going to stay up? Yep. All right. Let me ask you: Does every employee need the same ergonomic tools? Absolutely not. No, there, there's different things for different people, right? Right. That's just, a myth. Just, so, so company X comes in and they buy everybody the most high tech keyboard that has the uh, split that we talked about earlier and gives it to all their employees. That's not going to do it, right? No, no, because I mean, humans are all different, right? I mean, we're all, we're all different shapes, we're all different sizes. Would uh, you uh, it, Would you say that it depends? It, 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 it does depends. depends. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah no it it does depend but yeah it's it, it one size doesn't fit all this isn't a you know this isn't a, a hat or anything like that this is but not all hats fit everybody either exactly <laughs> right yeah you have you have small medium medium large, exactly and still those one size fits all um they still have three or four different sizes right, right. sure so um yeah so it it yes okay that's correct so we talked a lot about safety uh, and another er, uh, another ergonomic misconception is that ergonomics is all about safety is that true uh, it's, I would, I could argue sort of, sort of, um, yeah, I, I think I would argue sort of. So ergonomics is about, uh, is, is about helping, um, keep the, uh, the, the worker safe and, uh, making it, making their job uh, better. Right. We'll, we'll get into neuroergonomics a little bit later, but I'd argue that that's almost more efficiency based, right? Well, but if you're no, um, no. Well, it is. Sorry, yes. Yeah. So it is. It is efficient. Nick, you're no. wrong. <laughs> efficiency, okay. efficiency based, yes. Now, um, but safety though, uh, it is a big. It is a big uh, deal because if you're, you know, if you're, one of the big uh, misconceptions is lift with your knees, not your back. You've heard that, right? Right. Yeah. That's not really true. Um, and Ooh, it, it guess that what? one's not even on the list. I know. Let's I break that one down. That. Oh. It's, it's because it depends, right? It does depend. Um, it, it's because it, it depends on the weight. So when you're picking up a heavy box, say 15, 20 pounds, um, you're going to want to uh, lift with your legs. Right. Now, say you're picking up a box of 40, maybe 50 pounds. First of all, can you pick it up? Right. Second, um, think about the stress that you put when you bend down and you, and you lift with your legs only. The knees, um, the joints, uh, it's extreme pressure on your joints to lift that, whereas you, your lower back actually has uh, more muscle. So if you pull it up, so if you have straight legs and you pull that all the way up to your chest and bending, then at bending over and then lean back and then lean back with your back, you have more, more strength in your lower back, so you can actually so 
It does depend on when you uh, lift with your legs and lift with your. That's almost like deadlift style. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah, I remember a lot of this from uh, my one biomechanics class. It's really sad because I only took in in my entire um, graduate career. I only took one biomechanics class. Oh, that, I took zero, and I wish I had taken a couple because yeah. I, I love yeah. that stuff now. Yeah, I took a couple. It's yeah, it, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, the course load, uh, it, and it differs like across different programs. So if you're a human factors practitioner in training right now, just know that there are other courses out there, and um, you know your course, your coursework might not be all inclusive. It, it's it's good to kind of see what else is out there. One of my favorite classes I took was a work physiology class, and it yeah, and it, oh, yeah, it incorporated everything. I mean, all about uh, even thermal temperature, everything like that. It was it was interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting stuff. Um, I, I wish I knew more about it. That's why we have you on the show. So is ergonomics just for the office? I don't... Is this a misconception? Do people really Absolutely. think... Oh, for sure. People uh, think yeah. that ergonomics I, is just for the office? I, I think so, and that's that's very sad. But yeah, I think so because it's... Uh, I don't know. It, maybe it's a culture. Maybe it's, it's how they, they try to sell stuff. But um, no, it definitely is. I mean, um, one way to think of it is uh, I actually know a... a a rather large uh, car manufacturing company that they have started really pushing their ergonomics program uh, to where they have internships and and, uh, everything like that. So is that for the employees or for the cars? Uh, Both. It's for the cars to to design them to be ergonomically uh, safe and comfortable. Can you do ergonomic assessments on, like, car uh, arrangements? So, like, is my seat back just a certain angle? Like... Absolutely. You have people that... Can you do that before you leave tonight? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> pre-program his car for him. Right. Um, okay, so that's cool. Uh, not just for the office, it's for everywhere. And then, is it costly? Uh, it can be. It can um, be, yeah. but it's... it's. But it, but there, there are simple things that you can do with, with the stuff that you already have. Um, right, and we have those a little bit later, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about those in a sec. You okay. have some stats here that I want to get into, because these are cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, musculoskeletal disorders are the leading cause of pain, suffering, and disability in American workplaces. That's crazy. Yeah. So is that n- beyond just carpal tunnel? Yes. Yeah. Any musculoskeletal disorder. So um, lifting. Anything, and, yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Like that. Uh, huge financial burden, but the human costs are the best motivation for prevention. Okay. So that's that's basically saying that there's there's a uh, more sort of motivation to get it. Because of the human health Absolutely. aspect of it, Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and one of the one of the best things <laughs> um, money. that I heard um, is a great way to say it is it's kind of like an iceberg. So uh, a if a an employee gets hurt, um, you see the tip of the iceberg. They might miss a couple weeks. You might have to you know the employee might have to pay uh, for um, you know for workers' comp and all that. All the hidden fees all lie ninety percent under the water. Right. It's all the the legality of it. You know, can you actually uh, get put into litigation? Um, it's also uh, 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 other other employees start questioning. So then you have to start training people, and there's a lot more hidden costs than you realize. Every time I think of an iceberg, I think of Freudian psychology. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. The traditional model. Right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Well, it's uh, interesting you talked about the legality of it, right? Because there's like more and more research that comes out that you could like it's going to become the point where if they don't give you ergonomic options at your job, you could end up with a lawsuit on your hands. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And there's and there's a lot there's a lot of issues with that too. And it's um yeah it's it's scary because yeah if it, I see I feel like uh you know nowadays it's anyone gets hurt of, of anything it's it's let's go talk to a lawyer you know and oh, right uh, yeah yeah uh so. These are really interesting stats, but I, in the interest of time, and I want to make sure we get to one of our listener questions here, um, I'm going to go ahead and skip down. So you have some easy recommendations for people who sit at their desk, right? You, um, let's see here. Yeah, so so this is basically this uh, list of, uh, like, very easy to do, minimal effort. You can do this on your own. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. So um, I'll just go through them a little bit. So sure. um, one of the biggest things that uh, one of my big pet peeves is uh, people's monitors. So everyone, a lot of people have these monitor stands because they want to either put stuff under their monitors or they just like their monitors high up. Um, but that is that is very uh, poor practice. You really want uh, the top of the monitors to be at eye level. 
Um, so you want the top of it to be eye level, top, not like not the, the actual middle. monitor itself, like no. at your eyes? No, oh, because wow. uh, the reason why is because you really want... Keep your neck straight. Exactly, and yeah. at a down angle. Um, so you really want to be looking um, at about a 15 to 20% uh, down angle is what they say is optimal. Um, if you're actually looking up, it actually, again, it's kind of like that carpal tunnel. Um, it actually uh, uh, cuts off a little bit of the blood flow in your neck, and so that's why you'll get strained and uh, and tire out and fatigue really fast. So let wow. me ask. Let me ask about situations where you have sort of these control rooms where people have to look at monitors, right? And um, just from a design perspective, you'd want to put like less pertinent information on displays that are up above, right? Because then they'd be looking up, but they're not looking up as often. Correct. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and a lot of those control rooms. I mean, there's just so much information they have to portray. There's just nowhere else to put it. Right. Man, my so. neck hurts just thinking about that. Yeah. All right. What's next? Um. So the next one is uh, uh, keyboard. So we did talk a little bit about the feet. Um. You really want a flat keyboard. Um. If you can get slight angles because that'll actually uh um keep your wrist at a more neutral posture. Um. It keeps the bones in the wrist from crossing over. Right. That's absolutely. what I remember from. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, uh, and the also the other thing is you actually want to keep your keyboard um, slightly below your elbows uh, when they're at a ninety degree angle. Um, so uh, straight at your side, and then you want the the keyboard slightly below. Um, this so I feel like when I'm typing on a keyboard, I feel like my arms are really close to my body. Is that okay, or do I want to be like slightly out? Do no, I you don't want to be abducting your your elbows at all because again, that'll that'll force strain on your no, definitely not. <laughs> Just not that at all. <laughs> you're, you're not a bird. You're not flapping your wings. I am uh, illustrating perfectly how not to. Uh... <laughs> no, it's uh, so so you'll so abducting your arms, um, basically putting them out. Um, it'll actually put a lot more strain on your shoulders. Um, and again, all of these little things. Um, add up the neck, the shoulders, the back. That all adds up, and that's what causes f- uh, fatigue. Um, right. So you know, if you if you do cu- if, you, if you do find yourself in the afternoon starting to really come down and really start to crash, um, it could be just as simple as you know you have your monitors too high, uh, you're you're having your shoulders out out too much, um, stuff like that. So okay, I am really bad at this next one because I cross my legs all the time. <laughs> this one's really tough for me too. Oh, it's so I hard. can't ever keep my feet yeah. on the floor. You're, I don't know uh, why. Yeah, you really need to try to keep your th- uh, thighs parallel to the floor. Um, and if and that's you, just for the blood flow. And, and, and it is. It is for the blood flow and also uh, to keep your, if you can, uh, keep your feet on a footrest or slightly um, uh, Elevated. angled. Um, and again, it's all because of blood flow. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, and well, and I, uh, I worked with someone a long time ago who had uh, hip problems because they would cross their legs all the time and yep. the alignments in their hips would Absolutely. be off. And so they had to go to physical therapy to, Whoa. yeah, it was serious. And so like, ever since that, I like, I second guess myself every time I cross my legs and like, yeah. ah, no, I'll just... yeah. And, uh, and another thing too is the, so the whole idea behind the adjustable seat pan, which a lot of people like almost nobody understands how to use them. You don't want the back or the front of your seat to be touching the back of your of your knees because that'll right. actually cut uh, cut you, off the that you, ve- those those uh, veins going down there and they'll cut the blood flow off too. You kind of want your legs. legs hanging off of a little the front bit, of yeah, your chair. Absolutely, yeah. you want it. You want it at least an inch or two behind your legs. So um, the, now, what would the design of a chair look like? Can can you design it so that way the uh, seat is smaller so that way you're you always you you can, but that's also why it's an adjustable seat pan, so you can just push it back. Ah, okay. Because the back of the seat doesn't really matter as long as you have the lumbar and the back rest right there. Right. The, the, the bottom enough. of the seat can actually go yeah. back underneath that. So right. You just don't want your your knees, uh, the the front of your chair directly touching your knees. Yeah, I'm so. gonna I'm gonna go to my desk first thing tomorrow and fix all these things. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try and pay attention a <laughs> lot more. Um, all right. So you mentioned the uh, feet should be touching the floor, footrest. That kind of goes hand in hand with. Uh, thighs being parallel right? yeah yeah and then uh and then one last thing which i don't have on the notes but i did remember it and it's a good thing to remember is uh is the 20 20 20 rule have you ever heard of that any of you it's like uh 20 minutes looking at the screen 20 seconds no. out and 20 for wait every 20 minutes look is he totally 20 off? feet away no hang on every 20 every 20 minutes look 20 feet away for 20 seconds boom nail nice. this yeah, nice, no, yeah. that was at that company that I told you with the ergonomics people. Yeah, uh, my my coworker told me it's about that it, one. it it's it's very easy to do, and it's something you don't even have to leave your desk for. It's just the the problem is is again we get and and I'm guilty of it too. Is, is you, you get, get so in the zone, you get you get immersed, and all of a sudden you know you get in these very very uh, non optimal positions, and before you know it, you're you know slouched over looking at your screen about five inches away. And, uh, you know, so it's right. very hunchback. Now, yeah. now, let me ask you, would 10, 10, 10 work just as well? 
Probably. I mean, I don't see why not, but it's it, it it's not necessary. So 2020-20. Um, 2020-20. All right. So yeah. every 20 minutes, so three times an hour, look 20 feet away from you, so out the window somewhere for 20 seconds, and that will reduce your eye strain and re- it, it's just, it's good. Yeah, it'll just refresh <laughs> your senses and, and yeah. kind of, yeah. All right, so you have the NIOSH lifting equation here, but we are running a little bit tight on time, so why don't we do a whole episode on that? Because that... We could really break that thing down. You, you guys did a pretty good job, though. I was, I was, I was very impressed at uh, you guys bringing that up nice. and, and talking about it th- that last episode because it is something that's not not very well known, but um, it is actually really important. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I feel like we should do our do- due diligence and really break it down in an episode and give a couple examples. And I mean, calculations are just fun. We could probably do an example calculation on the show. Let's 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 do that. That's so, super absolutely. fun, yeah. yeah. Let's go ahead and switch uh, gears a bit here and hear from our listeners. <clears throat> so, hi, listeners. Uh, Yasmin D. from Virginia writes, Hi, thank you for your great podcast. I was wondering if you can have an episode on neuroergonomics. So we're kind of getting halfway there, Yasmin. <laughs> we got half of this episode on uh, neuroergonomics, and we made sure we brought in someone who knows what they're talking about because we really had no idea. So, <laughs> all right. So, Woodrow, uh, neuroergonomics, can you break that down for us? Uh, yeah. So it's um, it's kind of the, the blend of, uh, of, of using uh, taking ergonomics, uh, the physical aspect of it, and bringing together the brain, uh, the brain functioning as well, um, to design products. Uh, not only thinking about the physical aspects, but actually how it's uh, incorporating it and in, uh, uh, their mental aspects. Too. Right. So, like workload and um, other cognitive related and working memories. Yeah, like that. memory. Yeah, yeah all that stuff. Okay, cool. So, so the difference primarily lies between. The physical side of things, like how the body is and then how how the brain is while it's performing these tasks. Right. So you don't want to you don't want to be overloading them physically or mentally. And before they were kind of just very separate. It was uh, whether you were just, uh, you know, again, making them lift too much um, too often or on the flip side, on the, the mental side, it was, you know, where you. Were they uh, were they getting fatigued or you know a lot of vigilance tasks of you know air traffic controllers um, they get they get fatigued really fast uh, their working memory gets taxed so but this is kind of the merging of both right right okay so let's see here what what can you tell us about ergonomics you have some fun facts here is that what these are what are these <laughs> for oh oh um, yeah so these are these are some some notes I put in. Um, I was I was overlooking some uh, some papers that I I had read when I was in grad school. Nice. Um, Let's break some er- neuroergonomics down because this is this is cool stuff, and I, I really I really like this topic, and maybe we should have a whole show on neuroergonomics as well. I I feel kind of bad because neuroergonomics is getting the shaft here towards the end. I still just think it's really cool that they're trying to understand just like the neural substrates, right? Of what's going on in your brain, and like is is what we're doing design wise, either if it's a physical product or a digital product, really bringing you benefit not just physical but also what's going on in your brain as well right right yeah so so one of the one of the uh, things about it is um, you know neuroergonomics is kind of considering what makes work possible um, so it's it's uh, kind of like the the human brain and how you can actually understand the use of technology by humans um, that can inform technological design so again like you were saying the brain and also design you can uh, do that to um, make products better for the user so they use, do they use like CAT scans and PET scans and all this stuff while they're using stuff? To, to They do, yeah. It's actually really cool. I've actually seen a few studies. I've actually been part of a few studies, non-research based uh, myself. So, um, so are but, you developing a product when you like look at these? Or uh, you said non-research based, so that's well, why so, I asked. So no, that was just a, a, a health issue that I had. Um, but oh, okay. I got, but I got to use an EKG um, sleeping overnight. That was kind of cool. But that that's a whole other story. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> maybe for another time. <laughs> um, but no, they so they do do uh, fMRIs um, and uh, neural imaging, um, and so they have people perform tasks and then look at the blood flow within the brain. See, and, I thought that would be a really interesting one because now you're in the fMRI. I, I worked a little bit with them in undergrad, mm-hmm. and I just feel like that would be a really tight space to be moved. To be messing yeah. around with a actual how does that process. work? Yeah. <laughs> Break it down for us. <laughs> it's uh yeah no you're absolutely right man it's um it, it's very difficult because y- so with fMRIs you can tell exactly where the blood flow is going to the brain 
Right. Now, and now, the thing about it is, so you know where it's going and you know what part of that brain it is going to, but then how do you actually interpret that as workload, as mental workload, as as taxing that particular area is is where the, the magic really happens. And I don't know what the answer to that is. Yeah, I mean, that gets down into a lot of sticky questions that come with some of the neuroscience stuff. But right. it's still pretty yeah, that's and that's and that's above my pay grade. <laughs> so so the way fMRIs work though is they they kind of align um, the protons and neurons in in your brain and you can see how the blood is flowing basically right I'm trying yeah. to simplify this for our listeners that might not be familiar with what uh, fMRI does um, yeah sorry I'm used to a lot of these terms yeah I know I, if I, Billy was here he'd break it he would, he would, I yeah I know we're just we're just running amok without Billy um, well, it's basically just looking at where your brain lights up right right. So just like this, it's, I don't know, your amygdala is acting up because you're doing a task and you're frustrated with it, that kind of stuff. We, we should do a whole episode on on uh, brain imaging and and the different types of, I mean, I feel like it was, it's kind of related to psychology. And, oh, it's very oh related. no, it, it's yeah. very related. Well, I mean, yeah, it's totally related, but. We could do a whole thing on 7T and 3T machines and how it's different <sighs> when you're doing functional imagery. That'd be cool. That would be cool. Let's do it one day. All right, what else we got? Uh, so, uh, another thing is, um, neuroergonomics should not be viewed, uh, simply as the use of neural measures, uh, in applied work, but also as the stimulus for, uh, basically developing theories in human factors. What does that mean? Uh, that's a good question. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> words on a page. Uh, You're the expert here. <laughs> um, so basically what it means is, um, it, it's not only, you're not only measuring the blood flow, um, but you're actually taking that to actually apply it. Uh, to to develop theories for human factors. So you're actually using that as saying the reason this task is difficult is not only because it's um, you're asking them to look at these different screens, but you're also, you know, we're showing with physical evidence that you're overloading the work and memory uh, area of the brain or, you know, something like right. that. Right. They can, they can, this, I mean, it's, it's a lot of money to run these studies. Absolutely. Yeah. These machines. These are, machines are, cost a lot right. to run. Oh, yeah. And so, so what this is to me is, <laughs> share the data share the wealth like let's let's develop theories off of what we find in these things because it's not just it's not just about the product that we're developing now but how can we use what we find in this to apply it to later things exactly and the, and the, the problem with with theories is that it you know theories are great but they don't help the people in general so you have to apply those theories in order to um, help the population in general right there's a whole episode there I'm sure on how you know bringing theory into practice. Yeah, yeah applying, and that's, and that's 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 one of the things I love about human factors is you're actually applying the work, um, you know, not just all the research that goes behind it, but you're actually using it and applying it uh, to make a difference. And what can we do when we understand the brain a little bit better? Uh, when you understand it, uh, you can really provide um, kind of important guidelines, constraints um, uh, for you know the information. To develop task designs to uh, optimize for like say, using a, these theories. yeah for yeah. you know and, and potentially you know making uh, certain like warnings or alerts or signals um, and uh, yeah and uh, you know potentially maybe the design of robots <sighs> and I know you love robots we need a whole episode on a robot and I, I really feel like neuroergonomics cut the shaft a little bit but <laughs> that's okay we'll bring we, it back we are gonna bring it back. Uh, but if you guys want to be featured on our show, like Yasmin, we are all over social media. So go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. We're all over the place. You can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all your questions. You can also get to the front of the question line. We have a couple of them in queue. But if you want to get to the front of the question line, you can support us financially on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe us, and review us on iTunes, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or wherever podcasts are found. We're pretty much everywhere. We're always trying to keep an interesting to- topics that you guys want to listen uh, and hear about. I can't. Words are hard. Stop Stop laughing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to suggest a way. Woodrow, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll expect you to be back here a little bit later. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I hope I uh, Such a pleasure. some people, you know. Can our listeners find you anywhere if they want to talk more ergonomics with you? Uh, yeah. So we have a, I have a LinkedIn profile, Woodrow Gustafson. Uh, look me up. Okay. And uh, that's just linked on LinkedIn. Okay, Blake, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at UX Chill Bro. <laughs> All right. As always, uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. 
Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until next time, it depends. It, it depends. depends. It 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 depends.